What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Today, we're continuing a conversation on historic liturgical Christian worship. Stick around. <music> So if you're new to the channel, welcome. Definitely hit that subscribe button, ring the notification bell, share these videos with your friends if you think they're helpful, and take a scroll through. I cover a plethora of topics from incense to gun rights. It's it's all there for you. And by and large, everything is, is looked at through a, a historic Christian lens, and there's no way to beat around the bush about it to say that by historic Christian lens, I mean a Lutheran lens. So if you want to understand where Lutherans stand on the issue, that's why you need to subscribe to the channel. And also, I would recommend finding me on soundcloud.com forward slash Lutheran Lemonade, where I relax a little bit more, sit at my kitchen table, drink a beer, and talk about theology. You can find me there on Thursdays in the evening, because Ryan doesn't condone day drinking, for Lutheran Lemonade at soundcloud.com forward slash Lutheran Lemonade. I'm also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash 1517 films. Drop me a note there. Some of you have, and you've suggested some really good video ideas. If you got any more, there's always a comment section below. But let's get to it. So uh, I started a series a while back, and then life got in the way, and I haven't been able to YouTube anymore. But now we're back, and I want to pick up on this Lutheran worship thing. So I, in the last video, I shared video footage of me leading a divine service at the end of my Lutheran worship class at Concordia University, Wisconsin. Now, this is where I learned that there's actually value in the way Lutherans worship, the way they have worshiped, and, and that if you're looking for that authentic Christian worship experience, you will find it in the Lutheran church. So most Christians, when they look at worship options, they look at like Lakewood Church in Texas, and they see Joel Osteen in a stadium with a stage and a big globe, no cross, pre preaching health, wealth, and prosperity, and they sing all these great flowery diatribes that make themselves feel good. Or they look at the Roman Catholic Church, and they see, oh, they're chanting, oh, they're bowing, oh, they're doing this, oh. Uh, I'd rather go to Lakewood. In the middle, here we are. We're the Lutheran Church. We're the church you've been looking for. We are contemporary and we are historic. And historic carries a lot of weight to it. So we're going to talk about Lutheran worship on this one. We're going to start kind of I don't want to say tearing apart, but piece by piece going through the historic Lutheran liturgy. And we're going to talk about it. And I think it's it's great because the more you read and the more you read what the ancient Christians wrote, you can look at how they defined a worship service. And then you can go to a confessional liturgical Lutheran church and go, it's, it's the same thing. They're following the same order. Now, the variety has changed over the years. The, the, the tree that is historic Christian worship is grown and flowered over the millennia. Sometimes some branches grow a little too crazy. They get hedged back. Uh, new branches sprout, but they're always from the same place, the same tree. And I think the roots of that tree, if we want to get biblical, uh, as pointed out, as I quoted before, Reverend Will Wheaton this time on issues, etc., going through the historic liturgy, talks about that first Easter. And on that road to Emmaus, where Jesus comes up to these two people, bemoaning that Jesus is dead, and he asks them what's going on. And then they tell him, and he lays out to them from the scriptures, how everything must have been fulfilled in his suffering, in his death, and in his resurrection. And then Jesus takes the place as host at dinner. And at the breaking of the bread, he is revealed as the crucified and risen Christ. And then they go out and proclaim, we have seen the Lord. That, Pastor Whedon points out, is the order of historic Christian worship. And I think... We're going to start there. We're going to start with something that we call the invocation. That's where the pastor stands up and says, In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, 
Amen. And then we move into confession right away. And now I want to read something here. This is from Pastor Rick Warren's book, The, the Purpose Drivel Life, in, the, in day eight, where he says, Worship is not for your benefit. As a pastor, I receive notes that say, I loved the worship today. I got a lot out of it. This is another misconception about worship. It isn't for our benefit. We worship for God's benefit. When we worship, our goal is to bring pleasure to God, not ourselves. If you've ever said, I didn't get anything out of worship today, you worshiped for the wrong reason. Worship isn't for you. It's for God. Now do you understand why I call that book The Purpose Drivel Life? <laughs> it's amazing. He writes this book, and the first sentence is, this book isn't about you, and then the entire rest of the book is literally about you. Worship doesn't have its beginning in you or in me. It has and finds its beginning in God. And this is why when historic Christian worship begins, it begins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit with the sign of the Holy Cross as a tradition, long-standing tradition, long-standing tradition. This tradition goes way beyond the Middle Ages to the earliest centuries of the church. Christians were doing this to remember that they have been marked with the cross of Christ at their baptism, that it is into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit into which they are, past, present, future tense, baptized. This is why we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit to remember our baptism and because Jesus promises, as God the Father promised in the Old Testament, he is where his name is is. You heard me say that on my Lutheran Lemonade podcast the other day. God is where his name is. And so we gather in the name of our holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. Now we are in the presence of God. What comes next? Well, when Isaiah found himself in the presence of God, he fell to his knees and made confession of what a wretched sinner he is. And that's what comes next. And this is more proof that Rick Warren is wrong about what worship is. So I've got my trusty old Lutheran service book here open to divine service setting one as that's the service that we were going through in the video. So we'll watch a little clip of that and then we'll go into the hymnal. Please stand. In the name of the Father and the Son. Holy Spirit. Amen. We say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please kneel. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, when Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God, and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion. In the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So as you saw, we make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, uh, understanding the rubric to say the black and do the red. Now there's a little red cross there. You may, you are free to make the sign of the cross. Then the pastor says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And the congregation responds, but if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, is this vain repetition? Because as often as divine service setting one is done, these words are used. These words coming to us from 1 John 1, verses 8 through 9. This is a direct quote from scripture, and this is how worship always finds its beginning. As remember on the road to Emmaus, Jesus comes to them. And he hears from them. And he gives them his word. 
and that word is centered on who he is and what he has done for them. So can you see how Rick Warren is so wrong and how mainline American Protestantism is so wrong when they think worship isn't about, isn't for you, it's for God. No, worship is absolutely for you from God. You've also heard me say on my Lutheran Lemonade podcast recently, Jesus did not come to serve or but to be uh, the big gap. Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve. And he still does, just as he did on the road to Emmaus, just as he does now in the divine service where he gathers with his people where his name is. He comes to serve. And in that formula, in that order of the road to Emmaus, which you can read the early church fathers, you can look at the ancient liturgies and see that that order has always been followed. You can even find it in the book of Acts. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. You can see this order very early on in the Christian church. And that's why it's a great way to worship because it connects you. It's not just about you. It's not like you're in this big auditorium where the lights are dim so you can have this intimate moment with God. It's a community. It's the, um, what is the word I'm looking for? The ecclesia? Is that the word I'm looking for from the Greek? Uh, God's people coming together and not just you physically there present, but also all of the saints who have gone before us. And there's a specific piece of the liturgy we're going to get to later on that addresses that. So we begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we make confession, confessing to God what he has said to us. Confession, it, it, there's two kinds of confession. There's confession is in same speak, saying the same thing about yourself to God, and saying the same thing about God as he has said about himself, that's confessing, making a good confession. And then there's the second kind of confession where we confess our transgressions to God. Now, in that video clip, you saw that we just kind of skated over it. So let's, what in divine service setting one is actually said? Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. And just as when Isaiah was in the presence of God and cried out that he is a man of sinful lips and from a people of sinful lips, he made this confession about himself to God. God reaches out from the altar and touches his tongue and declares him clean. And that will come later in the divine service where God from the altar touches your tongue and declares you clean. That would be the Eucharist. But we're in confession and absolution right now. Now the pastor says, facing the congregation, you saw there was lots of turning back and forth, and there's some, there's, there, that, that makes a confession too. Where is the pastor facing? So who is he talking to? That's why you see the pastor turning back and forth a certain way. Who is he addressing? And who is he standing with? And who is he bringing to the people? The direction in which he stands also makes a good confession. The pastor then says, Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And again, a red cross at the name of the Son that you are free to make the sign of the Holy Cross. Now, what you heard in the video that I shared when I did this, I'm not an ordained pastor. I didn't, I don't get to say those words. I am not a called and ordained servant of Christ. I do not have the authority granted in John chapter 20 to forgive sins. I can forgive sins that you can commit against me. I can tell you that Christ has crucified, died, buried, and risen from the dead, and that you have the forgiveness of sins, but this Office of the Keys from John chapter 20 really is just for pastors. And it's jarring for some Christians to hear, who is he to tell me that my sins are forgiven? I remember um, it was a conversation with my grandfather once, and I actually got really catty about it. I got very mad. Or he's like, who does he think he is? I said, well, if you'd have paid attention to what he said, he said he's a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, not the pastor's, 
he forgives sins, a la John 20, 22. Now, what you heard me read is also in the hymnal in case someone is up there who's not a pastor or for variety. Remember, I said it's not always the same order every time. There's great variety in our liturgy. There's also... In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can hear the difference where the man standing before the people is including himself, as I did in that video, because I'm not an ordained pastor, and the ordained pastor who's up there saying, is a called and ordained servant of the word of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. So this is what Isaiah saw when he was in heaven. He made his confession, realizing he was in the very real presence of God, making his confession. That's the only thing he could do in the presence of a holy God was confess how awful he is. And God reaches out and says, I forgive you. Isn't it a beautiful way to start the worship service? And from this order of worship, we can clearly see already how wrong Rick Warren is about worship. Worship is Jesus coming to you with his word. And as we'll discuss later, with his sacraments to bring to you the forgiveness of sins. Worship, again, Rick Warren gets church and worship wrong when he thinks that you need to change your church to be about the, the unbeliever that's coming in. The unbeliever isn't in church because the unbeliever hates God. So worship is for the Christian. Christian worship is for you. It is literally Jesus for you. Where Jesus comes to us as he did on the road to Emmaus to hear our sorrow and our confession and our inability to understand. And he brings to us the word of God which is about him and what he's done. And by the end, at the culmination of the worship service, he reveals himself in the bread and the wine. And then we go forth in joy to proclaim to the world, I have seen the Lord. He is risen from the dead. Uh, people often say, um, I don't need to go to church. God is everywhere. But God is not everywhere for you. God is everywhere. God is here right now in this house with me. God is there with you wherever you're watching this. God is all present. But he's not here in this house for me. He's not. He, he's here in his word when I read it. And he speaks to me through the Holy Spirit, through the written word, to bring faith. Hi, kitty. But He's not for me in the sense that he says, take this and eat it. This is my body given for you. So we need to go to church as Christians every Sunday to honor the, the, the commandment to remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, which is really about the preached word and not despising the preached word, but also not despising the gathering of the elect, to the gathering of God's people. This is why when we say the Lord's Prayer, we say, Our Father who art in heaven, and not my Father, who art in heaven. It's a community. We are a community of believers. So when we go to church on Sunday, Christ comes to us. That's where worship starts. That is where Jesus physically steps down from heaven to dwell where his name is with his people. And he is there at the altar, which is why you will see as we continue, there are certain behaviors, certain actions that Lutherans will make towards the altar on which are the host and the chalice. I hope you found this helpful. This is just one small part of Christian worship. Lutheran worship, historic worship, this is how we've been doing it from the beginning. And the writings of the ancient church fathers are exactly the same. You, you, you could drop any one of them, of the ancient church fathers, into a Lutheran church service and through the miracle of time travel, maybe they went by TARDIS and they can understand our language, they would go, oh, they're doing the same thing we've done. So if you're looking for that authentic Christian worship experience, I would like to open up the invitation for you to come to join the Lutheran Church. We are the historic church. We are the Catholic Church throughout time and space, having been rescued from the laws of men, having been rescued from the burden of the law, and having been restored to the gospel in the mid in the 1500s. We are the historic Catholic Church. Until next time, 
May God bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.